Welcome to the Brains Magazine podcast, a podcast with in-depth interviews and conversations with world-class entrepreneurs, expert coaches, industry leaders, and international celebrities. Get exclusive insight into the world of business, mindset, leadership, and lifestyle with your host, Mark Sefton. I want to welcome you to this next episode of the Brains Magazine podcast. And today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Back. Dr. Back is the CEO of MedEx and Co. He's also the Achiever of the Year LinkedIn Award, also recognized as the world top 100 doctor, which is an incredible uh, testimony to your hard work, and also an author of 120 books. And here's me having written three, and I'm blown away by the fact that you've Row 120. How are you today, Dr. Back? Hi, Mark. It is a pleasure to be here. And uh, please, I'm just back. That's it. It's um, it's an honor to be here. The rest of it is I'm just like you, a guy looking to to find my ways and through my days. And um, if you stumble upon something, just push forward. And um, I'm having fun. It's, it's been a great ride. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just having the opportunity to just uh, dive into some of your work and and find out like about your mind and and the and the things that you're creating and the diversity within those, but also having a, a very clear commonality as well is a uh, really interesting. So I'm really looking forward to the next 25, 30 minutes diving in to your life, into your mind, and into all of the amazing things that you've achieved. Does that sound good? I'm all yours. If I may suggest, 25 minutes, it's a very short amount of time. So forget about the introduction in my life. Let's dig in what you want to know. And I try to answer my best. <laughs> Let's go for it then. Okay. So, you know, obviously, you know, you're recognized in the top 100 doctors in the world, which is an incredible achievement. How did that come about? And surely that must be one of your most proudest uh, accolades. To make a story short, um, funny story, I was never meant to be a doctor. You look at me, you see an immigrant, and my parents wanted out of me a doctor. That was the only way I can have peace at home. And I'm also the eldest of my family. So you know those immigrant families, those stereotypes? They are very true. That said, um, funny thing, all my parent family is are doctors, and I'm the only guy who made it to the top 100 doctor because I care about more than medicine. Mm. I got there because I care about my peers, because I care about health. Uh, health, mental uh, health, uh, health, mental health. Sorry, and um, I was the only guy as a dentist who was talking about something more than teeth. So within COVID, everybody was uh, benched. And if you recall, COVID, we were the profession that was benched two weeks prior to everybody else without any knowledge of what's becoming next. Mm. So uh, within a short amount of time, everybody was on the web looking for answers. And this is how I, I start connecting with people. We create something called a group called the Alphas, which we're just having one goal is to come together and try to help each other to get out of that crisis. Because many were thinking that they're going to go broke and even bankrupt. Many didn't know what to think as we would our titles and all the letters after our names. Within the worst health crisis of our lifetime, we were bench. <laughs> that tells you a lot of about your value. And I know that your audience is more entrepreneurs and you know people that are looking to 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 grow personally and this it takes you um it blows you right in the face with all the studies all you've done all the recognition and then you bench and nobody cares <laughs> for about three months so this is mostly how i made my name in the that, that sphere uh, by helping all my colleagues try to find answers going back there Today I'm working on um, on books uh, again. After that one, everybody knew that I can write a book within two weeks. Uh, that's my short achievement span. If you write it with me, you have two weeks. After that, it's I'm, I move on to the next one. People were betting against me, but before they had time to express the doubt or even say, "Yeah, yeah, that's bullshit," um, the book was out. And um, I'm, one of my chances, I have Apple and Amazon, even Barnes and Noble, and I'm so grateful that they are pushing my books within days to the, the, the distribution process. So put that in context. In COVID, everything was closed. Nobody was looking to expand. And then you have that crazy guy coming in, talking about solution, inviting people in. And then whatever we were saying was packaged in a book 
that by about a month later was available in 51 countries. Very quickly, I rose to the top with influence and uh, people, call, people often ask me, so that's my leadership style? I don't see myself as a leader. I see myself as a host. And but back then, my, my job was to empower people to share the knowledge, the fear also. And when you talk to many people and you put all of that together, you kind of have a, a good sense of what reality is beyond the borders, beyond the frontier, beyond even the time zones. And that's how we uh, rose back to the, into the profession. Today, I am still very influential because of my books, but uh, because we, we're working also on the next phase of the profession, if you allow me a few minutes, dentistry is something that we all need, but people despise. And this is it's too, it's too huge to miss by now. By COVID time, when we benched for three months and people didn't care much, half the population of the world were even happy. <laughs> mm. uh, <laughs> let's say the truth. Um, there is a reality that we have been disconnected from, and now we have to work to, to rebalance that, to, to make sure that this is useful to people, that people understand why is it, in the terms of health, of person, not as a, a tool. And this is what I think that the, the profession has been, has one kind of another side. This and add on top of this, that we are amongst the profession that are still lacking behind in the information age. And we saw that in COVID, if you close down our office, there's nothing we can do. So uh, this, those are the kind of work I'm doing right now in dentistry. And if you ask me why I recognize I'm not better than anybody else, it's just that I was there before the other one. <laughs> mm. Yeah, there's there's a lot in there that I want to come back to you on. The f the first thing I just want to ask you is, how is your company then revolutionising the dental industry? Because you started to touch on on that a little bit about your involvement within the whole dental field. How is how's your company actually revolutionising uh, that industry? Actually, um, what I just talked to you about the alphas was built on my philosophy prior to COVID. Is because dentistry has the highest rate of depression. And societal, and this is worthwhile. Uh, we are we are known to be elite, an elite part of a society, but then um, so many of us end up killing ourselves or depressed, and nobody addressed it. And this is a com a problem that was dated from about six or seven decades ago, and nobody even care, even dentists. This is how we agreed when we get to dental school, and uh, that shocked me. By then, I forgot about it, and then. I started having interns coming to my clinic. So it's about uh, 30 years difference between me and them. And they were still saying that they agreed with that phrase. I said, man, this is harsh. And I was about to, to, to retire from the profession. So I have to address that. So what we did is I, I sat down with the banks trying to figure it out. Why is it that dentists have so much burden? And to, to be very short, here is the, that situation. They are doctors. They are operators. They are surgeons. They don't have any rights to error. Every time you see a patient, it's all you're giving to that patient. Mm. But then when you line up eight patients, 10, maybe 12 a day, how do you keep that going? And the patient, most patients don't like to be there. Even if they stay polite, the energy you're absorbing from them, it's not gratitude, it's mostly stress. But you have to keep uh, your calm and make sure that everything goes smooth. On top of that, uh, and that was okay because this is, mainly what we'll be trained for. But on top of that, most dentists run also a mini hospital. And we were never trained for that. So when you run a hospital, you have your staff, you have your inventory, you have your rent. Uh, that's a lot to add on a line. Now, the other thing is also that we have been pumped up. So we, we are in our office like king, kings on the hills or queens on the hills. And um, we do good. We help, we, we, we help people, we help people. But eventually, you isolate yourself completely. And as soon as one thing goes south, it affects everything else because you're so, um, you so mortgaging all your resources, pretending to be perfect. And when I say pretending, we really believe that what we do is perfection every single time, or we try to. But nobody can last at that pace for too long. So mostly it's, uh, it was the ability of zooming in and out that we lost. And when you too much zoom in, anything that goes wrong can be the end of the world. Mm. 
So that's what I realized. I wrote a few books about it. I sit down with the banks and say, can we solve this? Because this is a huge industry. There's many people with great credits. And how can we unsolve this? So we arrive with solutions that dentists doesn't have. They still own the practice, but they don't have to own the facility in which they work. They don't have to manage as many staff. They just manage the team they're working with. And that makes so much sense to the banks in the financial of this world pre-COVID. Imagine after COVID. <laughs> mm. in, in, indeed, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, listening to you, one thing I wanted to pick up on is you, you mentioned that you don't feel like you're a leader, but a host. Is that right? What, what, do, you, what do you mean by, by a host? Okay, on this, if you allow me, let me just share with you where it's coming from. You call me today Dr. Bat, and I told you that the last thing I want to be is the, a doctor. But the profession accepted me for who I was, and it taught me one thing. Being called doctor, you always have to put the interests of the other person in front of yours. And that always reminds me that that's the way that a doctor is shaped. If you look at the entrepreneur side, if you're looking at yourself, you're very proud of inventing something, but by the end of the day, you are useless until you serve an, a big amount of people. So mostly what I, I said being a, a host, it's with alphas, I, was, I have access to people that could be my teacher three times over. But people didn't have the answer at that point, but they have so many other, so many other answers. I'm living within the, uh, that, that, that field of elitism of doctors, of financier, of politician. So all of them, I am learning from them. But again, they didn't have the answer. So all I did is set a table and just dialing with them, being polite and trying to have the best of each person who were willing to share, I recognize that the only way for me to get something out of this that can be helpful to everybody is to try to set pride aside. When you talk to a table of leaders and you say that you're a leader, you're in trouble. Because everybody said, who the heck are you? Or I'm better than you. And you cannot go anywhere with that. Hmm. Saying that you're the host, everybody's fine with that. And as a host, and I know Mark, I think you, you, you excel in that, your job, it's to make sure that your guests are happy. It's mm. to empower your guests. Mm. And the more you empower the other person, the more you have out of that relationship. Mm. So the, the idea why I'm calling myself a host, it was to make sure that pride <laughs> was left at the door. And when we arrive on the table, we're here to advance. And that served me very well. Once um, in an internal, on our international interview, they, they, they asked me, me and my alphas, I had to apologize, and I said on air, see, they're not my alphas. They are alphas. I'm just a host. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that I asked you about that. It's really interesting because, firstly, you're saying that, you know, you never wanted to be a, a doctor. And then very much, you know, you're talking about how, for you, it's not just a love of people, but it's also a love of that which you obviously teach, lead, and host in, which you know, in dentistry, um, you know, and, and I think that whenever I've come across doctors, they do fall in two camps. One, where they're very cold, it's very textbook, it's very instructional or or directive. And then you have another which is full of empathy, uh, encouragement, uh, inspiration. And uh, you do get a flux between the two. And, uh, and I have noticed that a few of my doctor friends have even started to move out of medicine and actually more into teaching, uh, coaching, uh, and more of the the holistic and the, and the more human side to, to the benefits of what they've learned. Are you seeing a trend here? Is this something that uh, you're also seeing? Absolutely. I think that COVID, especially to, to doctors and dentists, because there are two realities here, the dentists understood that they were not as important as they thought. And then they, you give them nothing but time to reflect on that. So that tells a lot. You also have the doctors who has been burned down on the line, on the front line. And they too are a rising question. Now, the, the thing that we don't say here, you know, that doctors are being burned on the front line. The nurse has been burned. And thank you so much for, for, for your effort because we don't say it as much. But you know that there are many branches of medicine that have also been put on the bench 
because they, they were canceling other operations that were not crucial. And these, pe these people couldn't do much, but they, they, took, they couldn't voice up their frustration because that would look very bad. Mm. But you, you cannot ask, let's say, uh, a, a surgeon to go at the urgency and to greet people. They, they don't have that skill set anymore. And if they do, they have to go through. So what I'm trying to say is, dentistry, it's kind of a specialized field of, the, this, uh, of medicine, but medicine by itself got the same problem, but people were much more, less inclined to voice up. That's why a lot of people move out of the sphere. Some move into cosmetic, and now they have a hard time coming back, not because that they want to go into cosmetic, but that's the only thing they could do. They had to have a life to, to attend. The teachers were all much very frustrated because they were left on their own. And uh, they, they, more than just looking for answers, they have maybe 100 students looking at them. So what do we do now, Doc? Mm. And everybody was improvising. So I think that the management of COVID, and this is no criticism, but just shed a light over all the weaknesses of our professions, not just in the medical field, but in all professional across. And those weaknesses and flaws that we have identified they're not going away. Mm. And they did this thing. So maybe that's why some people say, okay, I just identify something that I can address. Let go do this. Or some people say that I I'm done. Mm. I'm giving too much to this. And the word the kind of return I'm having, they, they, it's time to move on. That's kind of my situation too. It's uh, I was always in between. And after COVID, I realized that, geez, I can do a lot with a mic and a computer. <laughs> Uh, and it, it's so much fun because you have your impact is so much broader than just to well, just one person at a time. So um, I think that that's a trend, but not just in the medical field. That's a trend within all the people who were benched from the COVID crisis, which they knew that it could make a difference because many of us were benched. There was so much intelligence that was unutilized in the COVID crisis. Mm. You mentioned alphas a few times. I kind of just wanted to just pick up on this. Um, how how did that come about? Is that something that was born out of uh, the pandemic? Uh, and and what is it really about? Uh, back like what 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 is your vision with this? And and you know, uh, are people able to become a part of alphas? How how does it how does it work? Actually, alpha started just because we want to be the first on the ground trying to solve things that people say, oh, so what is the answer? And I know you recall at the beginning of COVID, we were all glued to our TV or radio and looking for direction. Because mostly it was so unreal that we couldn't do it. And that lasts for about a year. <laughs> you, 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 you couldn't plan your life. Everything was going to. And as an entrepreneur, I don't think that there's anything more sophisticated suffocating they have to wait for orders <laughs> mm. and when when those orders were kind of didn't make any sense you weren't there to rebel but you have to cope with that so uh the alphas came on, on the table just saying that we need the people who think they can make a difference please come and share your point of view your perspective we don't know what we can do with it but if we can we start organizing outside of what is official we can address other issues and that's what we did so the, we're not just doctors. We're not, we, we ha I had my friends coming in at the beginning. So doctors, financiers. I have a lot of friends in politics. Uh, and, you know, politicians also, they were very frustrated because there was no democracy going on. They were the people in power. And that was it. <laughs> so that is how we, we create a dialogue, understanding that we're not looking for the right answer. But we're, right, we're looking for a good direction. Mm. Then uh, the, the people... On the office, we need something more to just spread out that word. Because doing a podcast, you have kind of a limitation of the, the, the spread of your message. Even if Spotify and Apple was well, was carrying out a podcast. So I had that power to write books within two weeks. So with those people that I got along, I invite them to, to just join me in a book. Today, to join the alphas, you have to be a co-author. You have to, to, to have something to say. It's on invite. But tell you the truth, I, ne I never refuse anybody for as long as they have something to, to share and they, they care about something else than just selling what they have to sell. Mm. Uh, in the COVID time, the, the, the one of the rule was we're not looking to sell anything to anybody. We're looking to come together and to try to solve problems that nobody knows how to solve. Mm. And um, that mentality stayed. 
I can tell you that today we get together to democratize dental medicine. I have about 100 key European leaders in the dental field coming with me to, to do to write the first crowdsourcing book ever written in the profession. So mostly we're covering all the FEQ that people have in all the fields of dentistry. And this should be done by the end of this year, if not somewhere next year. And um, that was just a crazy idea, talking about sharing, collaborating, and telling that people don't have access to dentists. Let's share all the knowledge there. It doesn't cost us anything more than just writing. And uh, for, for, for most of my partners, they love it because within about three months, they have a, a book. You know, mm. you said that it's not easy to write a book. Mm. Uh, we made it very easy to mm. our partners because whatever we say, we had to deliver somehow. So for three years, we said, let's, let's try to rebuild this. Let's try to share. So we needed concrete projects. And the only way I knew that I can bring this the easiest way possible and the fastest way possible was to have books carried by Barnes & Noble that went all over around the world. And people now are just waiting for an invite from, from ours. Oh, that's a great legacy. So in addition to the 120 books that, you, that you've that you offered, uh, Dr. Back, how, how are you helping leaders emerge? You know, what what are you doing that's equipping others. It, it's very clear that, you know, you're you're wanting to be this host, but you're also really passionate about really helping other people emerge. How how are you doing that? I will start by saying that I cannot I don't know how to help leaders emerge because me my, I don't see myself as a leader. I see a lot of people pretending to be leaders and then they hit the wall of pride. What I will say though, it's I am somebody who's looking for a solution. I'm somebody who's trying to find the easiest way to get to a point without completing myself. Um, I used to use books to, to, to dive into somebody's soul. So let's say that we just met and we, we got a, a good talk and say, oh, let's write a book about it. To you, it's the best way that I had to honor you because mostly that's why you, you, most people approach me. I tell you that we're going to do that in two weeks for the person that is going to be there and say, yeah, great. This is going to take too much of my time. But you know that you have to deliver now. You have to do it. So the best way to cut down, if I made the bullshit, it's to put people into that mind frame. No matter the title, whatever they did before. Now, this is about this subject. And, and they, they are looking for guidance somehow. So, you know, when you write a book, you need to have a very specific audience. You need to, uh, a mission. And then you need to evolve to that mission. So when we do this, it's also the best way for somebody to prepare to go to battle. So to, to those people with experience, they love the fact that now we're talking about the past. It's easy to them because it's all about memory and we are making them make sense of what they did and why. When you address the same exact uh, technique to an emerging leader, as you call it, or somebody who want to make the difference, that's the best coaching school you can give because there's no resistance. Mm. I'm not here to coach them. I'm here to, as a mirror to reflect on what they say. And if they write it down and they read it, that doesn't make sense. They knew it. You know that when you coach people, one of the hardest things is to overcome the resistance of that person. Because mm. they want to change, but at the same time, they don't want to change. But it's kind of silly when you don't want to think that there's a problem and you want to stick with it. <laughs> So if, if you want the, the, the short answer, that will be how I help people. I'm teaching people how to reinvent themselves writing books because that's the power of narrative. With narrative, you, you make sense of what you did, why you did it, even if you fail. What's next? Mm. And uh, we, we're so used to consume all those legends, all those uh, TV shows, heroes. So we know how that is built. When you start applying that, those to yourself, it's like, whoa, that's another game. It's not a hard game, but with the courage to see yourself for what you are and then say, so what do I do with it now? Mm. So I, I don't think that leader is the only one who are benefiting from what I'm doing. I'm thinking that everybody eventually goes to this. Leaders will have more the inclination of going to this faster than most population because the rest of people are looking to, to, to observe first. But Going through a book, it's, uh, I think, in my opinion, one of the best ways to prepare yourself for whatever is coming ahead. Mm. Yeah, it seems that a lot of your work it is about solution-based. It is about 
putting your client, your customer, your patient first, which I think, you know, at the forefront of any leader, it needs to be somebody who is a lover of people, you know, and that's something that you kind of said from, from the very beginning, actually, that you're here to serve and inspire others. What's the best way you found to inspire others? Do you have like one kind of like particular way that you think that if we really want to inspire people in what we do, is is there one particular thing that you found that really does inspire people? Mm. I haven't prepared for that one. But out of my head right like this, I will tell you that the best way I found to empower people was to be kind, to be respectful, and to empower them. Because especially when you're talking for, for somebody who's younger, who have dreams, the worst thing you can do is to crush their dreams. Oh, this won't work doesn't mean that because you don't know how it works that they don't mm. what they what you have as a more experienced person it's you have that confidence that you can just transfer uh you're not saying to them to run to this and you you you're sending them to their, their death you know that they're going to do it anyway some mm. somewhere in time you were that person looking to just prove everything against the odds but would that be easier if somebody that you respect tell you that wow that's impressive. Mm. So uh, to answer your question in a simple way, I think that to be kind, to be open, to be available, but especially to empower, that's the best way to nurture leadership. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, it's it's making sure that you you live you live your work, you live your message, that you that you show up. You know, and obviously having wrote 120 books, you know, you're going to have had and made a massive difference and inspired and impacted a heck of a lot of people. Um, how how do we eff effectively share then what's in our hearts so that it does impact others? Because I know that you're all about that impact of heart, that heart leadership, that, that servant heart of wanting to do good. H how do we effectively share what's within us that can then effectively you know, impact and empower others? I'm going to answer your question by just taking a little detour here. Uh, going through my experience, people ask me, how do you write so many books? And by the way, I wrote 120 books within 60 months. Um, people say, oh, you, first at the beginning, they were asking me, oh, you don't want writing? And then they realized that nobody can write at my pace. Then if you write that many books, this should be shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, the haters, are, they all come in with all those original way to criticize your work. One subject of my books are about medicine, about economy. I wrote one about the, the energy formula. And that was one of the ones that I'm most proud of. Uh, lately, I got a book out on COVID economics saying that how can we tame inflation without increasing the interest rate? Coming from the UK, I think you're going to love that one. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say here is, the first book is the hardest one to write because it's all about you and you try to look good. As mm. soon as you get rid of that one, now it's getting easier. <laughs> you know how to write and then you start playing with the narrative, the words. The reason why I got to 120 is because I, I met with many people. I bring myself to the table, but because I was so open to listen to the other person, to either the concern, uh, whatever they see from life, I react to that. Some of the time, I wrote books based on my reaction to that. Other times, I invite them to have a discussion with me to write a book. So mostly, my journey writing books on 120 books, I think that on at least 90 of them, I was learning one I was writing. But because I was so open, I have access to more and more experience, more and more uh, challenges, more and more discussion that nobody had answers to. But by the end of the day, if you spend two weeks or three weeks, the, the worst, I, it's 11 months on a book. But um, if you go to one subject to the next, even if you don't have the answer today on that one subject, it's just, just like going to an exam. Buy your 50th book and say, oh, now, now I, I have the answer to my third book. And then you, 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 you write a second tome. You don't come back and rewrite the first one because that will be cheating. You write a second tome. So this is how we add up. Um, so to answer your, your question, I believe this, it's you have to live your words. 
you have to walk your talk. Mm. But you don't. If you always just walk the path, you're looping. Mm. Be open to meet with new people. Walk that, document it, and it, it's crazy how fast we can advance. Mm. I did have one final question for you, which is about one of your books. Because obviously you got 120, and I was having a look at the one, the one that kind of resonated, the one that I thought was topical, the one that seems to be quite juicy and quite uh, poignant at the moment. Uh, and it's the one around uh, how to leverage emotional intelligence. <laughs> now, emotional intelligence is like a massive like buzzword. It's so topical, you know, and uh, it's really prominent at the moment so how do we leverage emotional intelligence i would love for us to kind of end the interview around this all right and i'm looking forward to exchange with many on that subject because the first thing is i'm a doctor so i'm as, as a doctor i will just dig into what i already knew to understand emotional intelligence is kind of a dark subject there, out there it is energy some people are for it some people are against it it just it's just just positive thinking if you ground this back to how your body is built, we are uh, a bag of hormones. That's how we are. You can, just, you can try to pretend that you're smart, but by the end of the day, you are a slave to your hormones. Whatever your body produces, that's how you feel and you react to that. And this, no doctors in the world will tell you otherwise. Teachers would like to tell you that you can control those hormones. And that, was, I think, was one of the biggest lies we've been fed. You can try to avoid that, but let's say that you're scared. The hormone process through your body will make fear your reality. And the way that we are built, our receptors, will make us act as it will, if we were fearful. Anything else is just uh, a lie. Mm. If you're well-trained, you can try to hide that for a certain time, but that doesn't change the fact that you are fearful you feel that so if you you, you remove that if a hypocrisy and you you, you, you deem say okay if i ground everything to my body to my hormones this is the the core cool fact is there are many hormones but they are they're not as many as you think they interact with one another so if you understand the way that your body reacts to each hormones or the combination of hormones you kind of have a tool to one, connect with yourself. Two, read other people. So leveraging was based on those two partners. Now, if you know who you who you are, this is usually what we say, I know who I am, but that's in your head. The thing that's going to erase that when a second is how you feel, how your body feels. So if you can identify how your body feels, the key is always an emotion. So you feel happy, your body will produce hormones to make you feel happy, and this will be true. You feel fearful, your body will react the hormone, they will produce the hormones making you fearful. You feel that, and that's going to be your prison. Mm. Now, with your mind, you can decide to go on one side or the next, but that will not last for long because you're always a slave to your hormones. Mm. And I just gave you the key to understand other books. So in the book of How to Leverage Emotional Intelligence, I'm trying to go through the the, the main Emotions that people know in life. You draft the hormone map out of it, and now say, first of all, we have to stop the denial. Then if you accept that, at least you're in contact with your own self. Mm. And you know that the body, everything that we said here, it's not something negative. Your body is writing that to give you energy. Mm. So if you don't deny that energy, you just have a little more to go on with. Now, this is... On your part, the other part is if you understand emotions, you understand the hormonal map coming out of it, now you can read anybody, right? Because mm. people cannot hide the emotion for too, uh, too long. And you know, as soon as they get into a loop, you know how they're going to feel. So it's a matter of time before whatever they feel will make them act in a certain way. Mm. I don't know if I, I summarize the book, but I, I, I just kill one book. People, nobody will buy it anymore. <laughs> 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 I'm sure I'm sure that you kind of whet their appetite and, and given them uh, food for thought because it is so topical. So I think it's probably one that I'll do quite well, uh, I would imagine. Uh, Dr. Back, how do people find out more about you and your work? I am 
pretty prominent, especially on LinkedIn. I think this is how we connect too. Um, I'm, I'm mostly on LinkedIn because this is where I meet with my the office and also the new coming in. Uh, LinkedIn I love because you have a, a chance to look at what that person is before you start talking with them. That said, I'm also on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram. Instagram, I have to tell you that I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> I'm a little older, so I, I know that pictures are cool, but I have a hard time trying to find my footing in that. But LinkedIn was the, the place that I'm the most uh, active. This is to reach me personally. Um, I am in all the other distribution platforms, so my books are everywhere. I also have a podcast that I don't do as actively as you are, but uh, I have two shows, one called The Million Dollar Mindset, the other called The Alphas, because I am so busy. I just take the mic every time that I have something of worth to put on the table. So it's not something regular, but let's say that I just meet with a, a billionaire and we're coming friends. I'm going to have him on my show. Uh, if I, I meet a professional athlete that want to share, I'm going to have him on my show. So today it's more about who I'm meeting, but in COVID time, it was more about the needs that was arising. And if we have something to interest to, to share with one we online, um, but for your audience, the, the Brains Magazine audience, this is how I accepted also to, to join the family is my biggest goal this year will be to try to save our global economy. I know that sounds silly coming from a dentist, but I can tell you that it's not that hard. Uh, and let me, if, I, if you can give me a few minutes, let me just share you with you some, some facts that will tell you that we can make a difference. It's, they all prepare us that the recession is coming. Some people already have their head under the water because of the rise of the the rising cost of living, the the, the price of oil, the interest rate. And I know that in UK you've been hit pretty hard. Um, but they think that it's okay. The we have to control inflation, keep rising the interest rate. On that book, Cub Economics, I went through history. And by the way, there is a former number two for bank here in Canada that joined me on that book. So it's not just a dentist talking. I, I'm the crazy guy, but I have very smart people backing me up. There's an economist with us. And what we did is to go through history, to look at what happened, why it happened, and what we did. To give everything in a nutshell, we will be creating the worst recession of our lifetime. So if you take the five last recessions, three of them will be recreated within this one. Without COVID, we have COVID on top of that. So let, let's just cut the chase and go to the end. After the recession, what are governments looking for? Rebuild the economy. Who is doing that? Entrepreneurs. But through the management of COVID, we put a lot of entrepreneurs on bankruptcy. The other one, we asked them to take so many debt just to manage the crisis. And now you exploding the interest rate. Who will be left to rebuild the economy? Who will be left to feed the population of the world? Who will be left to make sure that we have a life to come back to? And this is, I think that it's obvious. And most thinker or leader of a world try to avoid that fact. Because they, ha they only want to know one thing. If inflation goes up, it is in all the books, we have to raise the interest rate. We have to slow down the economy. But that's not the situation. Today, there's a war who have kind of pushed the, 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 the price of oil to go higher. And because of that, everything else follows. The symptom may look like the same, but it's not the same illness. I'm, I'm, forgive me, I'm a doctor, so I can kind of use this vocabulary a lot. And in medicine, we have something called a differential diagnosis. So even if the symptom looks the same, you have to address the real issue. So this is a question of opinion, because if you ask all the economists, they will tell you that it's a very complex question. But what is the answer? Nobody has it. So I'm looking at each one of you, entrepreneurs, uh, those who are thinking, we've been docile in COVID. That was fine. Nobody knew what happened, and we made it through together. But now we can see ahead that our economy is crippling down. Will you, would you stay silent and say that, okay, I'm going to wait for my instruction and I'm going to follow them? 
I'm not looking to rebel here because I can tell you that a lot of former politician leaders, even prime ministers, have come to start joining me. We're not looking to rebel, but we have to put our message out there, come together and say that, listen, if you, okay, let's take them on their own words. The recession is coming, it won't be too bad, but then we're going to rebuild our economy as we always did. Can you do that with our entrepreneurs? Can you do that if you crush the dreams of an entrepreneur because you put them in bankruptcy? Not because they didn't do what they did, it's because they followed your rules. And I think that this is a universal message that can go to all around the world because we've been docile. I'm not telling you to rebel because that would be even worse. But if we organize and we can prove to you that there's another way, I will not tell you the solution because there's a solution and it's written that, the, that book called COVID Economics. I have to sell a book right by the end of the day. <laughs> but, but no, just a funny joke. I'm not looking to sell a book. I'm looking for you to read the book, to understand, to reach out. I will be active on the Facebook group of Brains. I will, uh, I think that my cover is coming out. And I know that Peter, when he recruited me, he told me that, well, as long as I'm here to help people, I will have the support of the community and the magazine. So this is my hope this year that we can come together to at least join our voice saying that, okay, we understand your point of view, but please look at this and look at the consequences of what you're doing because we, we haven't done fixing the problem coming from COVID and the pause and the fact that there's the shortage of labor, that people are changing their mind. Mm -hmm. Don't add more stress to the system because it will not last and we're still going to be here, but it's going to be chaos. It's going to be... A, and I can tell you that as an entrepreneur, if you break the dream of an entrepreneur, it will take a generation before you're gonna have somebody else replacing them. So here's my message to the governments. We are just people, we are just one vote. But how many of your people are paying to work? Well, today you have to manage a crisis of, uh, of people don't, who don't, doesn't wanna go work of people who just asking for a raise, sometimes that is justified, sometimes it's not. But those entrepreneurs that you're killing, those people are paying to work. Mm. They are your base of your solution. And until now, we've been, we have help. That was called debt. <laughs> and now it's another problem arising and you, you move on. So uh, I, I hope that I made my point compelling and i'm looking forward to meet with you the next alphas are the people listening to us today are the people who want to make a difference uh, last time i thought it was for my profession this time i'm fighting for all of us mm. yeah that's really clear like obviously you know the economy needs entrepreneurs it needs problem solvers it needs solution oriented individual and it needs uh, politicians and government to embrace and support that so that that we can collectively improve the economy and save it from destruction. So thank you for those thoughts, uh, Dr. Back, and for this rich interview. And I encourage everybody to go and check out your books and connect with you on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope I didn't take too much of my time. <laughs> all good, all good. <laughs> thank you for joining this episode with me, Max Sefton. I hope you've really enjoyed it. Feel free to leave us a positive review on iTunes. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the next episode of the Brains Magazine podcast.